Well, thank you, Craig, and uh, hello, Francis. <laughs> um, I thought we could, we could start by uh, talking a little bit about your background and uh, how, you got, how you became involved with trade unions uh, at, at the beginning. Mm. Why, I, was, I was a teenage trade unionist right. story. Right. Um, I, I think like a lot of people, it was a combination of family and my, my own experience. Um, I was thinking about this uh, uh, with my mum's birthday coming up, because when it was her 80th birthday, I think was, I can't remember exactly, I think that was short, shortly after I'd become Deputy General Secretary, and we'd got family coming over from Dublin, Manchester, London, all descending on my mum's, and, you know, I was in the mindset, we're going to celebrate a birthday. Mm. And when I got there, I was lobbied constantly on why the TUC wasn't doing more for <laughs> pensioners. <laughs> right, right, and, um, right. and I realised that, you know, it was the assembled ranks of Jack Jones's army. This was the, <laughs> the kind of foot soldiers in many ways. Um, you know, my dad was a steward in the car industry, uh, Massey Ferguson's all over Jacobs in, uh, in Dublin, that people had been active in their union. Mm. Um, so that was kind of always part of my background. Yeah. And then my own sort of experience, I think it's... I, Robert Taylor once described us, Robert Taylor, who yes. wrote yes, the Robert Financial Robert, yeah. Times, he described us as principled pragmatists. <laughs> and I think that kind of sums it up for me. When I, mm. when I first started, uh, I'd had lots of different jobs, but when I was working in the kitchens of the Oxford Colleges, because I was born in Oxford, and we got kind of organised there. I always remember we elected our shop steward, Maria, on the basis that she was the oldest at the age of 19, <laughs> <laughs> which seems a pretty good basis on yeah. which to elect her. But there was this sort of, you know, it was actually about pay, but it was also about the clocking in system and because we had class shoved in our face really yeah. you couldn't have got mm -hmm. a, a bigger con it couldn't have been better training i yeah. suppose for kind of privilege versus yeah. what was happening uh, below stairs as it were and the tyranny of the clocking in machine and yeah. uh, deductions from wages so i think there was that there's that sort of rebellion in a way a spirit a sort of rebellious spirit combined with we want to get things done yeah. So a questioning spirit, perhaps, yeah. is the way to say it, but with actually wanting to make a difference for for working people in the here and now. Yes. So that I guess those are the sort those of influences are the sort on of me. things that, that came through. Mm. Um, now, I mean, obviously, there've there have been some very important women trade union leaders, um, but as Craig was saying, not all that many, and and certainly you are the first. Uh, Woman General Secretary of the TUC. Um, it and took I a while. It took a while, <laughs> yes. And and I wonder, um, could you reflect a little bit upon that? I mean, how how difficult was it as a woman rising within the trade union movement? Well, uh, Craig also quite rightly pointed out that mm. the trade union movement is not always yeah. people's perception sure. of what it is. And some of us get a little bit tired of some of the, the sort of stereotypes mm. that are sometimes promoted because, um, you know, our membership for the first time in history is 50-50 mm. men and mm. women. That's a mm. big change. Um, if you look at stewards and officers, the picture mm. is very different. And when you get to general secretary level, three in ten of our union mm. leaders are now women. Are now, women. Mm. now, that's not good enough, mm. but it is a lot is better good. than Westminster mm. uh, the, around the cabinet table, and it's certainly a lot better than what happens mm. around the boardroom table. Mm. So we've got a lot further to go, um, but it's changed. And I suppose um, that none of that is to pretend that the mm. trade union movement is full of, you know, born-again feminists, because uh, <laughs> that mm. wouldn't be true either. Um, but I think things have changed and I think it has to change because it's about mm. who we need to organise. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's women as much as men. It's also black and ethnic minority as much as white and so on. Yes. So we, you know, as an organiser, we have got to look like uh, mm. who it is we want to organise. Yes. So it's important. It's an important um, shift, isn't it? Yeah. 
Um, just turning to questions about the changing context in which trade unions now operate. Um, first of all, the industrial occupational context. Obviously, we've, we've seen some enormous changes over the last 40 mm. years. Um, the um, trade union membership in this country peaked in 1979 at, at mm. around 13 million. It's now um, 6.5 million. It, it, it seems more stable now. It's not on a, it's not declining any longer, but it's not mm. rising particularly strongly mm. either. Um, the uh, and we've seen, of course, what that reflects is these huge sectoral shifts, the decline of of, of so much manufacturing employment, mm. the rise of 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 services and lots of uh, of work which is outsourced and and and, mm. and uh, um, uh, where there's very little. Um, uh, protection for workers um, and as you say we have uh, many more women are now unionized um, than uh, than ever ever before um, but we've also seen this shift we now have uh, still quite high unionization in the public sector but 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 uh, much uh, much sm uh, smaller in, in in the private sector and I, I suppose, and there's other changes too, of course, of which you'll be well aware. But the, uh, I just it, looking at that broad pattern of change over the last forty years. I wonder. Um, I mean, what do you think that are the challenges that creates for modern trade unionism? Um, what what does uh, uh, how, how has that affected the way the uh, the trade unions go about? Um, their work and also how mm. the TUC relates to that? Mm. Well, it's a very good question. And I think, you know, we know there are lots of different theories as to why we've seen that decline mm. and mm. labour market change mm. is one of them with, um, you know, I think as was demonstrated very graphically with uh, what happened to CityLink over Christmas, mm. huge swathes of the workforce now, mm. uh, not only on agency or even zero mm. hours contracts, but in the case of CityLink, for example, uh, huge numbers of them described as so-called self-employed, <laughs> yes, yes. you know, which yeah. uh, I think many of us felt was a very convenient way yeah. of jettisoning any employer obligations to yes, an employee to in terms of rights and protection. Um, and that kind of shift away from our traditional strongholds in manufacturing and steel, mm -hmm. in um, uh, coal and a lot of the areas where we were, we had battalions, if you like, towards a service sector economy with um, a much more insecure workforce, people mm -hmm. moving in and out of jobs and um, more quickly, obviously presents a challenge. Um, the legal framework for unions shouldn't be underestimated either. I mean, particularly during the 80s, we were battered basically every two years with more and more restrictive trade union legislation that uh, uh, tied one hand behind our backs in terms of being able to deliver for people. But the more I reflect on it now, I see it as part of this great 30 to 40 year shift towards the rise, you know, the rise of neoliberalism mm. and that ideology and a, almost like a fundamental um, attack on the values that trade unionism stands for, like equality and justice and fairness and dignity at work coming under huge pressure from mm. uh, the ascendancy of neoliberalism. But that doesn't excuse us because, um, you know, I think... Many of us are conscious that that first wave of new unionism mm. we saw um, at the end of the 19th century, uh, you know, people being hired at the factory gate, uh, people banding together against the most extraordinary odds. So there's a question for me about self-organisation and uh, when we'll see those waves that we saw of general unionism, mm. industrial unionism, mm. white collar unionism, you know, we've seen different waves at different periods in history. And I guess the challenge has always been to match capital. Mm. And we're clearly in an era now of 
as I would see it, networked capital, mm -hmm. where horizontal mm -hmm. relationships between firms mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. individuals are becoming much more important. Mm -hmm. The application of new technology is becoming much more important and integral mm -hmm. to the way that capital organises. And that, I think, kind of raises big questions for us about whether our structures, uh, which essentially have to be democratic structures, but whether we need to uh, do more to combine representative democracy with participative democracy and be more fluid um, and perhaps uh, take a few risks in mm. the way that we organise ourselves if mm. we're going to be in a position to deliver. Because mm. ultimately we've got to have a few victories for working people yeah. to make encourage people to band together. Mm. Can you give some examples of that? I mean, of that sort of taking of risks and, and I mean, are the, um, I mean, what, what do you see as, as the most fruitful lines of, of I think strategy? I think there are some interesting initiatives going on around mm. the world. So yes. in the international trade union movement, there's a very big debate about where that next wave will come from. Mm. Um, I think it's, you know, it matters mm. to us here in yeah. the UK what happens in Brazil, in India, sure. in Russia, South Africa, sure. and so on, China. Um, but, uh, you know, we've seen in the States the, the kind of fast food organising mm -hmm. campaign. Yes, in many ways, yes. uh, the key union involved SEIU has bet the house on mm. that campaign. Um, I am watch this space once this election is out of the way. Uh, we're going to be working on a new initiative um, around young workers, particularly in the service sector. And... Uh, you know, I hope I'll win the support of unions to mm. not only do the important organising on the ground, but be prepared to experiment and innovate a little right. about how we organise. Okay. So if you take last summer we had in, in London, in the Ritzy Cinema in Brixton, we had mainly young, very diverse group of cinema workers on strike for many, many days for a living wage. Now, that seems to me a classic example where mm. we could and we did galvanise mm. the wider community, a broad alliance in support of their campaign. <laughs> now, what if we scaled that up? Yeah. Uh, what if we uh, uh, looked at other groups of workers yeah. where yeah. we know getting an agreement with a single employer yeah. is never going to do the business in the sense of yeah. <laughs> actually winning for those workers, that we have to work beyond the enterprise and get agreements that cover mm. whole uh, sectors and new groups, mm. but where we also have to be prepared to, uh, in a sense, find those natural leaders and mm. let them lead. Yeah. That means, I think, some of our structures need to relax a little. Right, right. And, and how do you see the role of the TUC in all this? I mean, obviously, the role of the TUC has changed a lot, hasn't it, from... 40 years ago, in, 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 um, and it, it now performs, um, I mean, it has, a, it has a much bigger research arm and education arm and so on. Um, if only we were as big as some people thought we well, were. Okay. We, have, means... we have this incredibly talented, committed team. Yes, yes. Um, we do a lot of kind of important research. Yes. Um, uh, we run education programs, 50,000 stewards go mm. through our education program every year. We have Union mm. Learn mm. that trains up mm. a quarter of a million workers every year. We do a lot that doesn't necessarily hit the headlines, but ultimately we're the union's union. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's some of the basic stuff that holds true that uh, unity is strength. Mm. And the more that we can keep unions uh, unified, working together, uh, the better we will do. Um, but we also, one of my jobs was setting up something called the Organising Academy, which was to train up new blood uh, in the trade union movement to run organising campaigns. So we can often, um, it was never our intention that we could no. run the organising campaigns for unions, but we could be, if you like, um, a hothouse and a, a centre for innovation in the trade union movement, and now we've got mm. many more unions um, mm. on board running, doing their own thing, but mm. absolutely taking mm. on 
um, uh, some of the, the skills that mm. you know we'd identified and tried out on the ground and knew worked. Yeah. Um, so we've got a role in, in kind of leading, campaigning, organizing, educating, mm. you know, we're busy. We're yes, busy. Well, that, <laughs> and that's very heartening to hear because the, uh, I mean, one of the, one of the strengths of, um, I always thought about trade unions in, in the past was the way that, that so many trade unions were prepared to, uh, they had their educational programs and often in, in partnership with universities, in partnership with this university, but when I first came, mm. um, the, the uh, adult education department in the university um, ran uh, uh, day release classes mm. for um, Derbyshire miners, Yorkshire yeah. miners, uh, the, the fire brigade union, lots of, of different, different unions, and uh, various lecturers from across the university would, uh, as, as well as um, staff in the like lecturers in the adult education department would uh, 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 contribute to these uh, these classes, and it was a it was a, a very extensive program. And, and of course, you know, universities have changed, unions have changed, and, and and that's all sort of fallen away. But it was a um, it was an extraordinarily valuable um, uh, meeting place for um, for both um, academics and 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 for trade unionists. And, um, so it was a and I know there's one or two people here tonight who are involved in, in, in those programs. Um, and it, it, uh, it does seem to me that, that, um, that the, the, those much wider cultural aspects of trade unions um, exactly. are, are tremendously important. But applied in very practical ways yes, too. Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, you know, again, Ruskin College yes, and the alternative right. plans yes. for Cowley. And, and, and the Northern College up in... Yeah. Northern College, yeah. Um, yeah. the Lucas Era space yes. that depended, yes. um, alternative plan, which depended yes. very much on those close links between academics and trade yes. unions. And of course, yeah. some of the weakening of that is as much about what's happened in higher education and exactly. the pressure exactly. on yeah. academics to you know, produce the money yes. um, right. as, as what's happened in unions. But I hope we're rebuilding those because mm. I see that as absolutely critical in a period, and this may sound ambitious, but it is, um, where you know, we're not just trying to win a campaign, mm. we are trying to shift the paradigm Yes. So on, you know, as you probably know, one of the TUC's big campaigns, and we had a big demonstration last year, Britain needs a pay rise. Yeah. Behind that is a lot of work that is yes. about challenging mm. uh, uh, austerity. Mm. Uh, that's become easier in some senses in that, you know, it's clear the Chancellor is... Uh, missed deficit reduction targets and yeah. borrowing targets yeah. by a country mile. So it's beginning to kind of crumble uh, at the edges. Uh, but it's important that we not only attack that, but that we actually offer a constructive mm. vision of an alternative. And we mm. need those links to help us do it. And we need mm. to win public opinion, but also the intellectual argument. So mm. I see that as yes. a very, very important um, development yeah. for us. Okay, great. And then um, to think a little bit about the changing political context, again, looking back over the last 40 years, um, the, uh, I mean, there's, there's no doubt that the previous power and influence of trade unions has sometimes been exaggerated. Um, I mean, I remember the 1970s, and it wasn't uh, always quite as portrayed in some of the more lurid uh, tabloids. But the, um, but but still, between the 1940s and and, and 1980s, the trade unions had a, a centrality in British politics, um, which uh, they've since uh, um, they've since lost. And and trade unions were a, a, a countervailing power. To capital in the way in a way which um, um, uh, they, they aren't now, and, and, and some academics talked about them being governing institutions along with the employers and, and government itself. Um, and and there was that whole institutionalisation of relations between unions, employers, government mm. in things like uh, the NEDC and the. Uh, 
um, the prices and incomes policies, the, the tripartism mm. of those years, mm. and the, uh, um, I mean, the, the, so the degree of consultation of, of, of unions was at a very uh, um, uh, high level, at least in, uh, in, 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 in formal terms, and I suppose the, the social contract of the 1970s was, again, a, a high watermark of that whole um, period. And, um, and obviously, it, it, we're in a very different political context now. Mm. And I, I just wondered how easy you, you think it is now for either the TUC or the trade unions to exert political influence um, mm. now that so much of that institutionalized structure has been dismantled? Mm. Well, I'm always conscious of the difference between access and influence. Mm. Yeah. And access, even under this government, we've got plenty of access. Yes. Um, that's not necessarily <laughs> the same as uh, right. winning yeah. influence. Yeah. Um, but th there's more of it you know, I think mm. I think the the stories were exaggerated both ends sure. in the sense of sure. you know it was built up as uh, being yeah. far more powerful than it was in the seventies yes. and then described as having disappeared. Yes. Whereas, yes. you know, there are still institutions that are important for us that are tripartite, like yes. the Low Pay Commission, sure. ACAS, Industrial sure. Injuries, Health sure. and Safety Commission, and sure. so on. Uh, so it's we haven't important we to remember haven't those things, yeah. isn't it? But, but a lot of that. That some of that those structures of the past are still there. They and we fought yeah. to keep them and there. And we still them. have to fight right. uh, to keep trade union presence yeah. uh, on some of them currently, um, including the gang, gang, gang master licensing authority, which you'd have thought yeah. nobody would want to get rid of us from, wouldn't no, they? No, but you, anyway, you think that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I think there is uh, an opportunity for us. I, mm. I mean, I, I had my, for my sins, I had my second visit to Davos uh, this year right. as part of um, a very small but beautifully put together tra international trade union um, crew. Um, so there are, you know, six of us from around the world, um, the charity cases, if you like, who were uh, paid for. And we try and kind of lobby the World Bank the OECD, you know, IMF, all, and get as many mm. meetings as we can. I mean, the, the first year I went, everybody was talking about inequality. Yeah. And we were saying, we've yeah. got a few answers to right. that, including right. stronger unions, collective yeah. bargaining, tried and tested ways yeah. in, to try and uh, reduce greed at the top and improve uh, the living standards of the many. This year, they looked a little shamefaced because there clearly hadn't been much progress <laughs> <laughs> having set this as the big challenge mm. the year before. Um, but I think it's going to come to a crunch point. I mean, we're mm. seeing that in Europe uh, with Greece. We're seeing it uh, around the range of countries and in the UK too. That, you know, the reality is you can't redistribute wealth unless you're prepared to redistribute power. Yeah. And uh, trade unions, for all our imperfections, are democratic organizations of ordinary working people with something to say and some good basic values about wanting to help working people. Yeah. That's all we are in the end. We're you know, working yeah. people's organizations there to help each other, stand by each other. Um, and in the end, if we're going, if if mm. there is, if we can secure political will mm. to tackle the root causes of inequality, mm. then we have to have a stronger role to play. Mm. And building new institutions is mm. part of that, mm. um, including mm. on pay and so on. We've got detailed proposals on that. Anybody can look at on the TUC website. Uh, you know, it's an important part of it. Mm. Uh, but I think we're in a very critical stage at the moment as to which way this is going to go. I mean, just, just to share with you, mm. one the most alarming thing mm. I heard at this latest Davos, which somebody said almost casually and wasn't challenged, was um, no democracy and good governance is better than democracy and bad governance. And it sent a chill up yeah, my spine, yeah, actually, particularly yeah. if you think about 
yeah. you know, the rise of Golden Dawn and the rise of the far right in a yeah. number of different countries, yeah. Yeah. that democracy could be denigrated so easily. Yes. So I think this is this yeah. is a very important stage for us. And one the, of those times. And when the idea that you could sustain good governance without a democratic exactly, underpinning. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so it's a, it's a dangerous time. It is a dangerous but time. But also a time of great possibility yeah. for us yes. if we seize it. And looking at uh, more parochially at um, British politics, uh, mm. obviously there's a the long history of, of the, the unions and the Labour Party. Um, it's, a, it's a very distinctive model. It's not a model which is uh, you find many, many other countries of the world, uh, many other parts of Europe. Uh, and yet it, is a, um, it, 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 it still exists uh, more than 100 years since it, 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 it first arose. Um, but what do you think of, of, of it for the future? I mean, obviously there's... there's there always has been restiveness on both sides, uh, but there, there is restiveness at the moment on, on, on both sides. And there are people who say, um, now that there's a lot of unions that are no longer affiliated to the Labour Party, that actually it might be better if uh, the trade union movement as a whole was not linked to one political party, but was mm. free to engage with several political parties, particularly now that we have so many political parties. We have the Greens, we have UKIP, um, as well as the, as the, the, the Lib Dems and, and, and Conservatives and Labour, um, and of course the, the Nationalist parties. So um, Britain has a much more varied party system. Is mm. it? Um, what's your view about where the trade unions should be now? Should 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 the 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 link with Labour still be um, a priority to, to sustain, or, or, or should we be looking to a different model? Well, the, the TUC, as you know, is it is neutral, affiliated to any political party, though we yes. gave birth to the Labour Party. Yes. Um, and around, and you know, my, I see my job as representing the interests of working people, who are, whoever yeah. is in power, that's okay. the job. Um, around 15 of our unions uh, are affiliated to the Labour Party, that's out of 50 plus, but of course it's true the big ones are Unison, mm, Unite yeah. and so on. Yeah. Um, now I think that relationship is inevitably in evolves over time, I don't think anybody should mm. get too prescriptive about no. the nature of that no. relationship, but at a personal level I ask myself would working people be better off if that link was broken? And my conclusion is no. Mm. Um, the, I think, you know, as I say, we represent um, the interests of our members with any, any party, but there are certain values uh, that it, we mm. hold in common with Labour. And I think that have been revitalized more recently with Labour. Um, you know, in particular, I think Ed Miliband's focus on tackling the root causes of inequality is very important because it demonstrated a willingness to intervene in the market that many will have felt we had not seen for some time uh, in quite that mm. way. Um, so I think the the opportunities to tackle the you know the stuff that people care about, decent jobs, fair mm. wages. Mm the chance of a home, uh, you know, the need to build more council homes, the chance of having a voice and some respect at work. Um, you know, in a sense, there's no secret about what we want to see out yeah. of any new government. But it's clearly, I mean, again, it, it, it feels like quite a fluid time. Yeah. Um, I think um, there are some people who feel bruised by the experience of what they perceived as a as a Labour Party that wasn't doing enough mm. uh, to stand up for working people that seemed to accept that globalisation meant that you just had to accept what was thrown mm. at you and the, that the best they could offer working people was encouragement to get skilled up and mm. almost as a mm. personal insurance against... Uh, the cold winds of globalisation, uh, which hardly felt adequate um, mm. when we were 
of seeing such a, a growth of inequality between the top and everybody else. Mm. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, I think it was Lewis Minkin who famously called it the contentious alliance. Uh, yes. <laughs> perhaps inevitably that yeah. will always be the case because yes. we have different jobs to do. Yes. But the need for an alliance, I think, can't be in question. I mean, mm. I think many trade unionists know our own history. We've mm. known it's always important for working people to have a political voice, but the industrial mm. voice alone wasn't sufficient. Mm. You know, we wouldn't have equal pay. We wouldn't have health and safety. We wouldn't mm. have, you know, all the mm. things we fought for. Mm. Um, or the minimum wage. Mm. The minimum wage or mm. the NHS, for that matter, mm. had it mm. not been... Uh, that trade unions had a political voice. Mm. So, uh, you know, and of course, you know, as we see certain fundraisers involving hedge funds coming out of your ears and uh, mm. pawn barons and banks and Russian oligarchs, you know, I think it's become clearer and clearer that uh, unions offer the cleanest money in politics. Mm. So, uh, you know, and and... For sure, Labour is being massively outspent uh, mm. currently, but I think it has, uh, I think the ground war potentially is Labour's to win. Mm. Okay, thanks. And so let's turn now to some policy issues. Um, I thought we could start with some, some current ones. Um, the uh, David Cameron this week proposed uh, compulsory communities. Um, service for 18 to 21 year olds um, who are not in education or, or in work. Um, how does the, what's the TUC uh, view of that? <laughs> the printable version. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, th I think, um, I think we've seen so many initiatives um, that are actually work fair mm. by any other name. Mm. Um, and, you know, we know that uh, we have a problem with the compulsion principle because we know that uh, where there are good programmes, you don't need to beat people into mm. taking part in them. Um, they, they volunteer for them. They know they're good. And we know that, uh, um, you know, forced unpaid labour is not going to lead to the mm. real paid mm. jobs mm. that people need. And worse, actually, it's a source of potentially of cheap labour that displaces existing jobs that people maybe would have got training in and yeah. an opportunity to uh, get a pay packet at the end of the week. So um, we're not overly impressed by this. We think we need um, instead... Uh, we've argued for a decent jobs guarantee mm. uh, paid at, at at least the national minimum wage with real training um, and development opportunities and uh, the opportunity for that to lead to a real mm. job. So uh, rather than these sort of, I think we'll see mm. a few of these sort of yes, uh, yes. Uh, announcements I'm, I'm sure <laughs> for some before. reason in the, the yes. next couple of months. Something to do with something that's happening in May. Isn't yeah. It? <laughs> But the much harder challenge that any party should be grappling with is um, commitment to an intelligent industrial policy to create decent jobs and apprenticeships and opportunities for young people in particular in the first place. Mm. And that's, uh, you know, that means we have to yes. tackle some of our long running yes. problems like yes. underinvestment and indeed a corporate governance system that is clearly bust. Yes. And... and Another sort of related issue is, is the raising of the pension age, which all parties are committed to now. Mm. Um, and obviously, there's, there's the issue... Um, I mean, if people are living longer. Um, there's the issue that uh, also of, of people's right to work if they want to work beyond retirement age. Mm. On the other hand, there's all the issues about... Um, uh, job blocking and the, the, the effects on, on recruitment at the, uh, um, at the bottom end, uh, pe people joining the, the, the labour force and, and finding there aren't the same um, jobs available. Um, so again, I mean, that's, that's quite a complex 
because there's there's potential of generational conflict o- over these over these issues, and there's also the issue of mm. of, of how long um, should people have to work before they they get a pension and so forth. Mm. Again, how, how is the TUC thinking developed on this? Well. Um, I mean, I agree with you that we're all for uh, flexible retirements yeah. and um, uh, tackling age discrimination and, um, you know, making that process more mm-hmm. humane and mm-hmm. working for employers as well as workers. Um, but, um, well, I'm always struck by the fact that, you know, it looks like, you know, it's 68 for workers. Um but top directors, on average, collect mm. their pension at the age of 60. Mm. And I've always wondered about that discrepancy, <laughs> about um, what, what's good for the top somehow isn't um, good enough for everybody else. Um, but I think, you know, again, we're seeing um, inequalities exacerbated mm. in the way that our pensions policy works. Um, you know, uh, we know that uh, people from uh, people who are lower paid are much more likely to die earlier um, and not actually get the benefit of their pension for as long. Uh, we know that um, there are lots of people in their fifties um, finding it difficult to get mm-hmm. work um, and certainly work that suits them. We know that if you're if you've done a very stressful job. Uh, perhaps mentally stressful as well as physically stressful. Uh, you know, the idea of people running out, burning buildings, carrying, uh, rescuing people in the fire service at the age of 60, you yes. know, is a bit of a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think I think we've got a kind of a real difficulty here. I mean, as, as you know, we've seen the collapse of many occupational pension schemes. The TUC has concentrated on our contribution has been around auto enrolment, and we know again it it doesn't currently provide a good enough pension for people, mm. and too many low paid workers um, are locked out. But it's c- trying to create an architecture mm. again, reconstruct an architecture based on the idea that people need a predictable income in old age rather than individual saving pots. Um, as uh, some of the government's policy seems to be taking us in the direction of. Uh, so I think, I think kind of in sum, really, it comes back to this issue about how we distribute the yeah. wealth that we produce. Yeah. And pensions, as we know, are about yes. deferred wages. Yeah. It's, about, it's a part of that package. Exactly. And, you know, we have seen this huge shift between the 70s to the present day yeah of uh, wages taking an ever smaller share of yeah. that total wealth we produce. And it yeah. does seem extraordinary that what actually is a wealthy yeah. country like the UK yeah. Yeah. Uh, is unable to provide can't, properly. Can't afford pensions anymore. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And as you say, the risks of displacement of young yeah. people too. Yeah. I mean, it, it, um, well, it goes into another issue, which has been recently in the news, um, which concerns John Lewis, and um, mm. which, uh, uh, of course, has always presented itself as a model employer, and many people um, think warmly about John Lewis in all sorts of ways. But then we suddenly learnt that uh, um, their, their their policy of 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 when they said that people, everyone working at John Lewis, um, was uh, protected and 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 shared in the in the profits of the business. Um, of course, uh, that that was then revealed not to include the uh, cleaners. the cleaners. Mm. And, uh, and and so John Lewis have now changed their website. So it now says people working for John Lewis. Uh, and of course, that means that the cleaners are not included because they don't work for John Lewis. Um, and uh, in a way, it's a, it's a parable of our. The problems of our time of low mm. pay and 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 the difficulty of ensuring a living wage for um, for all workers that even a, a company like John Lewis finds it uh, um, f- f- finds it expedient to actually um, 
distinguish between different mm. uh, groups of workers that are, are uh, uh, working for it. And a, a group of workers that does an absolutely essential mm. uh, job. I mean, John Lewis stores would not be the same if yeah. the cleaners were not, were yeah. not there. Yeah. And I, I just wonder, I mean, um, I mean, and John Lewis has a, a uh, apparently, you know, a corporate governance structure which is much more advanced, much more yeah. progressive than, than than elsewhere, and yet there's still this uh, th this problem. And I wondered, what what's the way of tackling these sorts of yeah. of issues? Well, I think I think the Living Wage campaign has yes. been a wonderful alliance of um, yes. trade unionists and um, uh, faith and community organisations, because one of our our best um, chances, I think, is about pricking the conscience of yes. the nation to put yes. pressure on corporations not to outsource their responsibilities to yes. pay people a decent wage. And I, and I, just to say, I get kind of irritated by some on the right who say, well, the Nas that's what the national minimum wage is for. Well, the yes. national minimum wage at £6.50 an hour for the adult rate um, is only ever was only ever intended as a flaw. Mm. Um, the, the living wage uh, is calculated to include such luxuries as your children being able to have a birthday party, being able to take your children on a holiday, nowhere flash or foreign, uh, you know, a, a, a week's holiday in a British seaside. Um, having a television, not Sky or cable or anything like that, just a television. I mean, so it's very mm. modest, but yeah. it's what makes the difference between yeah. being able to, to live and being able, and just existing. Um, so, you know, we're, we're obviously very much part of that campaign, and I think we have seen some results, mm. um, tangible results in mm. kind of uh, pumping up the pressure on that front. The only, the only thing I would say is that, for me, it doesn't stop with the living wage. Mm. Uh, the living wage is only about uh, pay. And, you know, too often I've come across, um, I know of examples where employers say, OK, then, we'll get the certificate. We'll, we'll rob you of your sick pay and your holiday pay and put that into your basic pay. And now we can claim mm. we're a living wage employer. Mm. So, you know, it's the whole remuneration package that counts. And mm. critically, the difference for me between a living wage and what I describe as a fair wage is when workers get a voice in it, yeah. uh, when we're able to bargain. So for me, it's not it's, just about not winning just, the living yeah. wage for those cleaners, but organizing those yes. cleaners mm. so that they, so that they, they a, get to have yeah. a say too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't think we should be, you know... I mean, David Cameron um, is now backing the TUC's campaign, Britain Needs a Pay Rise. Um, yes, he, uh, I, I've noticed, yes, he's, he's suddenly <laughs> he's, become very keen on it. Yeah. He's, uh, he, we yes. can add him now to, we've got yeah. the CBI, the Institute of Directors, uh, David Cameron, a host of others. You know, I mean, it, we're, yes. we're feeling all loved I out know. in the I TUC know. currently. I, um, uh, I guess the way they could, you know, be good if they practiced what they preached when it came to nurses, midwives, teachers yeah. and yes. uh, college yeah. lecturers. So they could make a difference. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, turning, we mustn't go on for too long, we must open it up to the floor, but it's just one or two issues, uh, sort of broader issues. I mean, one is around the whole question of immigration and, and mm. the EU. Um, the, uh, obviously, immigration... Um, on all the polls, it, it's showing very high levels of concern amongst uh, voters across the across the spectrum, um, and it's very much tied in now to the whole debate around Britain's future in the European Union. And the uh, um, the trade unions have always had a, um, a complex relationship with the European Union, and, and in the past. Um, the, uh, Many trade unions were um, were negative about it because of the particular form the um, the common market had, and then um, more recently, and particularly since uh, Jacques Delors' speech uh, in 1988, um, the trade unions have become much more sympathetic to the uh, 
the idea of social mm. Europe and, and the, the possibility of, uh, of uh, U European cooperation and, and, and so on. Um, I wonder where you think on these, on mm. these big issues, where the TUC and, and the trade union movement now, now stands and with the prospect that, that we might be facing a, a referendum mm. on the European Union in the, mm. in the next few years, we don't know, but... Yeah. Well, you're quite right. The trade union movement never signed up for the common market. No. Uh, it was persuaded uh, by Jacques Delors' promise that the EU would be a social market. In mm. other words, that there would be this grand bargain between uh, capital's right to uh, move uh, goods around and um, protections for workers and also that right to dialogue, social dialogue mm. between the social partners. Um, so that model, that social model has been under huge pressure in recent years. Uh, we haven't had the same, you know, we forget sometimes a lot of the rights we have here in Britain, we only got mm. uh, from Europe originally through directives, whether that's maternity rights, equal rights for part-timers, uh, equal pay for work of equal value. These rights mm. all came, uh, holiday rights all came from Europe originally. But um, we haven't had any new agenda yeah. around uh, workers' rights for some time. And in the meantime, um, you know, we've seen uh, what's happened in the the so-called program countries, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, um, Italy, uh, where collective bargaining has been smashed up, mm. where the Troika have uh, called the shots, and where there has been, in Greece in particular, real hardship, mm. real serious hardship, mm. huge youth unemployment, people queuing up at food banks in even mm. more than in Britain. In Britain yeah. um, so there, I think it, it's, uh, our support has always been conditional. Yeah. And uh, as you say, if we do end up in a referendum, um, it will be a very interesting debate uh, within Congress. I mean, on, on this issue of freedom of movement, um, We've, we've done a lot of work on this. On uh, We're very right aware of how the right were using mm. the agenda of migration. I mean, the, the truth is there have always, always been employers mm. who look to use cheap labour, yeah. whether that's migrant workers like my mm. Dublin granddad and my mum, yeah. or um, whether um, it's women as a whole, Yes. Uh, young people, uh, workers have been brought from yeah. Scotland or Newcastle to yeah. other parts of the country to yeah. undercut pay. So there's nothing new yeah. in the world no. about, about employers <laughs> looking no. to undercut paying conditions and yeah. agreements. Uh, the question is what we do about it. Yeah. And uh, we know we certainly get the support of the public when we say <laughs> the problem isn't migrant workers. Don't blame migrant workers. The problem is the bosses who exploit them. And we need to get tough on mm. those bosses who mm. exploit them. And when it comes to issues like housing, um, again, you know, don't blame migrant workers mm. for the fact that this government has not built council housing to yeah. the volume that's needed, uh, particularly for young people and young families. So, um, again, we need to shift the debate onto that territory about yeah. how we deal mm -hmm. with exploitation, mm -hmm. how we deal with underfunding in our public services, mm -hmm. how we deal with uh, uh, ensuring that, you know, on construction sites where uh, migrant workers are often employed on agency contracts uh, as a way of getting around, paying them the rate for the job, how we deal with zero hours contracts in the care industry, again, where we know um, huge exploitation of dedicated, skilled workers. Um, but there are practical solutions to this. We know mm. it. Uh, mm. We can, if we want, we can come up with agreements yeah. that raise 
the level of pay, raise the level of treatment of people um, and ensure, because the truth is, you usually find wherever migrant workers are being exploited, you'll find workers born yeah. and bred here yeah. exploited, exploited in the same way. Well. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. in the end, again, it comes back to unity and building yeah. that unity. Yeah. Okay. That, um, I was going to ask some questions about the welfare state, but perhaps we'll leave that for the audience. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll finish on, on one uh, f final question, which, which touches on some of the things we've been talking about. Um, the, uh, the increasing inequality, um, the imbalance um, between labor and, and, and capital, which is probably greater than at any time now since the, uh, since the 19th century. Um, and if, uh, Ferdinand Mount in his, in his mm. book, The New Few, I mean, uh, mm. has that, uh, that story about the um, uh, H HSBC and, and, and the, uh, the Sir John Bond earning 400 times mm. the, uh, uh, what the cleaner in his off office was, was, was earning. It was raised at the shareholders meeting in, in, in 2003. And, the, and just the, the, the sheer enormity of, the, uh, of those sorts of disparities which have uh, um, exploded in, over the last uh, two or three decades um, and the the coupled with the the, the stagnation of, of living standards for the um, for the majority um, e even during the good times before the financial crash and now we've had the financial crash and we seem to be in this sort of limbo mm -hmm. still um, okay. and I just the the I mean one of the th I, I know one of the major concerns of, of the TUC and, and certainly one of the major concerns of Sperry has been th trying to think about um, a new model of political economy of what actually could um, could lay the foundation for a, a different sort of period from the period mm -hmm. that we've uh, we've been through in the last few decades the old model seems to have failed but but where where do we look for a new model of, of growth and, and what role should trade unions play in mm. uh, trying to develop a, um, a new model which, which will provide a, a different sort of basis for prosperity and, 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 mm. and, and um, uh, political stability and so on. And I, I, so I'd just like to end on this, that question. I mean, it's, it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... Uh, what, what your thoughts are on that, and, 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 and um, are you optimistic or, 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 or pessimistic about, about whether we can find a way through this? I'm always optimistic because that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a because uh, it's always a good sign. I think trade unionists wouldn't get out of bed in the morning <laughs> if we, unless we had a kind of uh, resilient optimism. Um, but also because um, I think there are cracks in the old order. Yes. Um, I think, you know, I think it's pretty clear that ordinary people are pretty fed up, you know, at a, at a popular level, we're fed up of being ripped off by the banks. We know the banks haven't really been cleaned up. We're fed up that um, there's so much tax, tax avoidance and evasion and, you know, they seem to get away with it. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, more worryingly, uh, a disaffection with uh, a formal politics, um, which I, I have I watch quite carefully because yeah. I think yeah. you know it's it's risky. I'm not a Russell Brand mm. fan in the sense mm. of I yeah. really hope people do vote because I think yeah. it's important uh, that that uh, we keep democracy vibrant. Uh, but I, but I think there are cracks in the old order too. I mean, one of, part of my job inevitably is I talk to a lot of business leaders. And some of the conversations um, would be funny if they weren't tragic. You know, when you mm. ask people about their pay, yes. <laughs> which they generally don't like you asking, actually. No, but, uh, no, funnily they, enough. Um, they, get, they go shy, don't they? Yes, they so. Well, they, they're, they're actually personally affronted. Oh, yeah. And... Um, 
and a lot of it boils down to good old fashioned leapfrogging. You know, they, they will genuinely sit there and look you in the eye and say, mm. well, the reason I get X amount is because he gets even more. <laughs> you know, so they are human beings in a way. Yeah. Um, but there are other, um, in a way, <laughs> um, there are other business leaders who recognize this particular model of capitalism isn't sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, they know if there isn't some redistribution in terms of the cake back towards wages, that if there, if, if, uh, too much of profits are just going into people's mm. pockets or offshore and not into investment, that mm. actually that's a problem, mm. that this is mm. a downward mm. spiral and we'll end up in this classic going Japanese, mm. stagnating mm. along the bottom economy. Um, and they're worried about uh, disorder. Mm. They're worried about instability, uncertainty. And so, uh, you know, I think that it's not monolithic, as it no. were. And that my belief is that this is a, a transition phase, that we have the opportunity to make the argument and win the argument um, for a new deal, a new consensus around values that I think served us very well uh, mm. post-war. Um, but of course, these things don't fall into your lap. No. Uh, so ultimately, I am a trade unionist. I believe that we have to organise. Mm. Uh, we have to, uh, you know, no doubt try out different ways, including in the community as well as the workplace. But I, whatever, I'm sure, the one thing I'm sure is that we have to build our organisation to be in a position to bargain. Mm. Um, so... I'm an optimist, but it will be hard work and it could take some time and we have to be persistent and resilient, uh, not least because if the Conservatives do uh, were to uh, win power next time, then as we all know, they have set out now that they plan to attack trade unions and uh, some of our fundamental rights uh, full on. Uh, because I believe we are, in the end, the last line of defence for working people. So they're going to go for us. So, you know, this, this election matters, mm. this whole period matters um, a lot uh, to the people we represent and the people we aspire to represent. But, but I think we can do it. OK. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Francis. It's been a pleasure, and I hope we'll see you again soon. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much.